So let's explain what the security budget is. Yeah. Yeah, because that's an important factor for some people in mind. Yeah, I think and there's been more discussion around it recently, which I'm happy to see. Uh, so security budget, it's kind of a way of looking at all of this Bitcoin that's being mined. Uh, like how much does all of that add up together over the course of, you know, like the time frame doesn't really matter. It can be a week, can be a year. Uh, but in the report, I use like the yearly budget. And that budget's supposed to pay for all of the miners to be involved. Uh, like to keep running, to stay profitable or break even at minimum. And uh, that needs to be there because without it, there's just not much of an incentive to secure the network. And in this graph here that we're showing on the screen, uh, it kind of shows like, you know, in the early years, you just don't really see that on uh, the scale of billions of dollars. But then starting from 2014, I think it first touched on about a billion dollars and it kind of started going up. Uh, this graph, it uses the average uh, Bitcoin price for that year. So mm -hmm. like, you know, if miners decide to sell their Bitcoin at the bottom, which you might sometimes see, then that is not accounted for a year. But about $9.5 billion uh, in 2022 was a security budget. And then a lot of people have questions around like, you know, is, is that enough? Like, you know, it, should it be more? Is, is it better if it's more, if it's is it secure enough like this? Like, what are we protected against? Does it mean that if someone comes in with $10 billion that they can disrupt the network? There's lots of questions that people have around this stuff. Um, and what I've typically seen in general is that a lot of people say like, you don't have to worry about this. It's a lot of FUD. Um, but I think it's really important to acknowledge that if you're very much into Bitcoin, you like you might have a good understanding of how this stuff works and you might feel at ease like, you know, it's gonna work itself out or like we have like actually disrupting this network is going to cost way more than you see on the screen in terms of uh, billions of dollars because you need to get all the mining equipment, you need to get it online without anyone noticing. Uh, there's just lots of these factors. But if you're not so much into Bitcoin and you just read this headline somewhere yep. in the news or you hear it on Twitter from someone who is trying to pump their own coin and saying like, Bitcoin's not going to be secure in 10 years from now uh, because of like the security budget that's going to plummet, etc. Like once you start talking about that, people get worried because they don't have that deeper understanding of like, you know, what, what can people even do if they have sort of a significant portion of the hash rate? Like, does it just shut Bitcoin down or does it make it insecure, et cetera? So I think it's an important topic to talk about a bit more and to not sort of hand wave away like this is going to be OK, guys, don't worry about it, because a lot of people actually don't take that for an answer, especially investors who come in from an outside perspective, they're not really into Bitcoin, they just see it as part of their portfolio. All it takes for someone like that to sell off their, their investment is to just hear a couple of these headlines that say it's not going to be secure in the future. And then if they try to do a bit of research and everyone's just saying, ah, oh, it's going to be fine. It's also interesting looking at this chart just to see the kind of percent of the security budget, which is coming from fee rewards. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it looks like in 2021, it looks like we probably, well, actually, as a percentage, it's probably not as high as. Yeah, 2017 was about the peak. So it was about 13 or so percent of all of the uh, all of the, re the total rewards. So to reiterate there, the miner who adds the block to the blockchain, they get the block reward, which is fixed in the protocol, how much mm -hmm. that's going to be. And then they also get the fees for the transaction in that block. And during 2017, there was a huge bull run. So people were just sending money like crazy. Exchanges were very mm -hmm. inefficient with the block space. So in general, the price was $50 quite, fees. Yep, was quite high. So that added up a good amount. But now we've been seeing it much lower than that. So people start to worry because if you actually dive into this different scenarios, which I've also included some images of, like what is actually going to happen to that security budget? And then you can totally imagine why someone who is not so familiar with Bitcoin starts worrying. And I don't raise these numbers and, and items to try to create FUD and to try to make people worry. I just think it's good to look into, to do more research about, to talk more about, because if we don't do it, people will take this as a talking point to attack Bitcoin and to talk about how it's not going to be secure. Mm. Um, but it does look like the security budget of 2021, uh, the amount that came from fee rewards, is about the same as 2015's total yep. security budget. Uh, uh, no, you're correct. Yeah, yeah but yeah, I mean, yep. maybe it's a little bit less, yep. but about that. So if the, um, you know, if there's a lag from the uh, fee rewards of about, I don't know, five, six years from the network, 
but we continue to see that growth in fees, then we know we're heading to the trajectory is towards a place where the security budget from fees can be high enough. Theoretically, yeah. Theoretically. So I, I dive into a couple scenarios because I was also like, you know, why do I do this research? Because we're like curious about what is the future of the network going to look like. Mm. Uh, it's just important to have a bit of an understanding of that. Uh, and I don't know, Danny, I included a couple slides as well with a few scenarios to dive into. But first, here, oh yeah, I also make the comparison to gold because actually I think Lynn Alden brought this up in one of her, she also did like a fee security modeling okay. post, which was uh, really in depth. And she mentioned like, you know, if you look at gold, gold has uh, uh, its own security budget as well because people need to store it in vaults, et cetera. But I figured like gold is a little bit different because gold is not on a globally shared ledger that you can just attack from anywhere in the yeah. world if you have hash power. Uh, and it also lacks a lot of the properties that Bitcoin has, which could make, for example, nation states want to attack Bitcoin. Uh, that's just, yeah, it, it's a very different type of thing. So I don't know if it's as easy to say, like, you know, if we just look at a couple other assets, like how much are people spending there on security and just say for Bitcoin, it's going to be pretty similar. Uh, I don't know. I don't feel confident enough to say like that is a good, healthy approach to look at it. But if you do take that approach of the 0.7%, which is from what I could tell, sort of what people are spending to secure their gold every year. Uh, if you take that for Bitcoin, then you'd get to a security budget currently of about 2.2 billion dollars. So yeah, I'm just not sure that analogy works. Yeah, but looking at the number earlier, you know, yeah. if that's the 9.5 billion dollars or so, then we're significantly overshooting this mark. But the question is, yeah, it's just a totally different asset, totally different model. Uh, so it's kind of tricky to make that comparison, I think. And and I don't think that for a lot of people who dive into it a bit, they would feel enough at ease to say, like, okay, this is a good way to measure it. Because it's just an arbitrary number at the end of the day. It's, it's essentially, it's a number that's being set by people who have vaults and it's like a, it's a market for, uh, you know, where can you store your gold or not. But uh, yeah, I dive into a couple of the scenarios here and I try to look at some different ones. Like the first scenario, what if there's no additional Bitcoin adoption? And I know that's really depressing for people to hear because everyone wants to see Bitcoin succeed, but kind of assuming mm -hmm. a really bad scenario, you know, if we sort of keep the median transaction fee of uh, 2022, which was about $1.5. And I know some maximalists will be screaming like, you can't measure the fees in, in dollar terms. It has to be in Satoshi's per V byte or something like that, but you just, can just to make it approachable for people. So there are about a hundred million dollar transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain in 2022. Let's say we have about the same number because that's just sort of where we're hovering. And the median Bitcoin price, uh, if that remains the same as it was for 2022, then the security budget would reduce to $446 million in 20 years from now. So there is a reduction of 95% compared what, to where Why we are. is that? Because the block reward is going to be decreasing. So the number of Bitcoins that you earn if ah. you add a block to the blockchain, and then more of the budget needs to come from transaction fees. Huh. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So when you look at this number and when people are using this number to create FUD, like to make people worry, you know, if you're talking about a 95% reduction in security budget in 20 years, if there's no adoption, that's, it's a, it's a pretty steep decline, but yeah. you know, like no adoption, I, I think like a lot of people are into Bitcoin. They're not expecting that in 20 years from now, the Bitcoin will be more or less the same size it is, as it is now. And, and this is because what you're saying is, is that if everything stays equal, but the block rewards falling, and if Bitcoin is set the same worth about yeah. high 16,000, 17,000, uh, the miners are going to be rewarded with a lot less. Yeah, exactly. And therefore, the security budget reduces quite significantly. I mean, what is that? A 95% reduction? Yeah. Uh, and so that would mean that the network is uh, a little bit more fragile, yeah. considerably more fragile. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we need we need the price to go up. That would be handy, but I try to look at this as well. You know, like what if earlier you asked, like how much do we need to grow to get to a Z-hash? That's a times four. So what if we take sort of the same approach with the median price from 2022? That was my second scenario I took. Then you get to a median Bitcoin price of 140, 114K. And, you know, the median transaction fee, let's say that stays the same. We just mostly have people hoarding Bitcoin. And as a result, like not much, not much more on-chain activity. So in that scenario, even though the price goes times four, we still end up with a reduction of 87% of security budget in 20 years from now. Wow. So that's start, like, for a lot of people, that's a bit of a wake up call, like, okay, hold on, like, we can't just buy and hold Bitcoin and only do that. And that's going to help 
like again, like sort of adding a caveat there, like this does not necessarily mean that Bitcoin won't work, that it won't be secure, but it will be looked at in a different way if the security budget decreases, because we honestly just don't know how much do we actually need to fend off all of these potential attacks. There's no like uh, enough security budget. Yeah, it's it's kind of like with physical security. You know, you could spend a hundred thousand dollars every month on physical security, and someone might still figure out a way to kill you. Uh, yeah, that it's just a, a tricky thing with security in general. This is absolutely not unique to Bitcoin. It's just insanely difficult to model for. So, uh, so did you have a number for that the price needs to be at to be able to maintain the security budget? Yes, we so that's now? indeed that's the next scenario where okay. I was wondering, you know, if there's no more, if the fees don't really go up, people are just buying Bitcoin and just holding it over time, um, but on chain just doesn't get used a ton more. Then in this case, Bitcoin would need to reach like it's somewhere above 900k. Okay, we like that. In, yeah, in 20 years from now, to sort of match the 2022 9.5 billion security budget. Well, I hope it happens. I hope I'm still alive. Um, I hope so too for you. Yeah. So this says to me the most important thing we should be doing is driving adoption. Yes. And the 100%. second and the second most important thing is driving usage. Yes. Yeah. Oh, one hundred percent. This is really the thing I'm trying to make clear with this is a, a lot of people in Bitcoin have this perspective. Like, there's just been a meme for a long time, which is buy and hold, and then the price will go way up, and we're all going to get rich, etc. But I think it's really important to think about the security budget as sort of a sort of an incentive for people in the space to think about how can we actually get adoption. It puts a bit of a time frame on it, not so urgent that you think like you know if. If the security budget decreases too much, it can't be used anymore, time's up. But a lot of people look at the halving of this way of, you know, this is, like, it will make the supply scarcer, et cetera. That's great for price, et cetera. But I look at more of this, more as like, you know, another four years have passed. What have we done to make Bitcoin more accessible, more usable for people to get it in the hands of those who need it the most? And I try to look at it a bit more like that. Like yeah. how can we see this as an incentive for ourselves to not sort of fall into this slumber where we're just buying and holding and thinking of new narratives to sort of be philosophical about Bitcoin, but really like, you know, how can we sort of stay sharp and, and see how can we get this to the people who need it? 